Okay, guys, let's get started with the lecture today. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about social influence. But before we get started with that, um, last time something didn't work out. And I always, I always feel like it's anticlimactic when there's not the solution to it. So I wanted to show you this. So I had asked you about the, the weight of the, of the animal, so which one is the heaviest. And, uh, you know, collectively, you actually, you, you, you were spot on with the, with the African elephant. Um, the distribution was not perfect, and I've done this before. It's simply, I don't know, we only had 16 replies here, but if you would have gotten more, uh, I would have been quite um, confident that the distribution of the weight of the other animals would have, would have matched that as well. And the last time I did, actually, it did work out. So there you see, actually, where large numbers actually really matter. Uh, so this experiment uh, doesn't work that well when uh, that many people participate in it. But nevertheless, I don't know, collectively, you guys kind of figured out, thought that the elephant is the heaviest element, and that was actually correct here. Okay, so that was one example of the uh, wisdom of the crowd. Uh, I ended uh, the lecture by talking about when the wisdom of the crowd can fail. And in this regard, I talked about social influence. So when people influence each other, when people start talking with each other, for example, about which animal is the heaviest in a way, this really odd thing happens that the wisdom of the crowd is not that good anymore. Yeah? And the reason for that is because diversity disappears when you kind of throw social influence in a way. While when we have like uh, um, no social influence, people kind of have that diverse set of knowledge and pieces of information that would go away through social influence. Actually, it's an interesting research area. There have been a couple of other follow-on papers about how social influence actually interacts with the wisdom of the crowd. It's, uh, it's quite fascinating. Okay, so today I talk a little more generally about social influence, and then I want to uh, jump into two landmark studies, so to speak, uh, that highlight both uh, about, first of all, how macro-level conditions can influence individual behavior, you know, when we can think about our Coleman boat and how these things are related with each other. That's the first one, the medical innovation study. And that's an old one. That's the stuff that you had to read that's really a god daily paper with all sorts of problems by it. But nevertheless, it's a classic, you know, in this area of social influence. And then the second one is sort of more like a modern day classic. It's a, a paper by uh, Matt Salganik, uh, Peter Dodds, and, uh, and uh, Duncan Watts. Actually, they had like two papers in that regard. It's about an online experiment. Uh, conducted 10 years ago, and at the time it was quite a landmark study, and even up today I think it's, it's a pretty cool design, uh, and also some great findings. Okay, but before we get started with that, uh, I want to do a little experiment with you guys as well. So, um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you a video, and uh, please pay attention to it, because there's going to be some questions about it afterwards.
Okay, so what is the, what is the story here? Uh, why am I showing you a video like this? Uh, well, actually, as it turns out, a couple of you guys had to yawn. Um, even the fact, if I just say yawning a few more times during that lecture, actually makes you more likely to yawn. So, uh, so when you hear the word yawning, you know, chances are you have to yawn. Uh, actually, it's working already, there you go. Uh, and actually, when I teach this, I have, to, I have to yawn all day long. It's kind of crazy. So it's not just the 9 a.m. effect that we have here, which probably adds to it. Um, but yawning is actually incredibly contagious. So it's one of the things that you can actually try out, you know, I don't know, sit in the, sit in the arts cafe and just yawn very publicly and observe what happens. Uh, chances are that you can make other people yawn. And the odd thing is we, we don't really know why that is the case. It's actually a puzzle, you know, that, I don't know, sociologists don't really care that much about, but, you know, others, and uh, biologically, there's no real reason for yawning, you know, and uh, it's really a mystery about why we yawn, and even more so why it is contagious. Some people say it has to do with empathy, you know, I don't really express it, so we show our empathy, and there's, there's one study that I came across, which was funny in that regard, we actually shown that even dogs yawn, uh, when, when they see people yawning, and there they actually had this, and that's sort of the kind of sort of science you want to do. You want to have like a moderator here, you want to see, and they kind of found that dogs are more likely to yawn when their owner yawns compared to when other people yawn. And that sort of support for this idea of empathy a little bit. You know, they can relate to a person more in a way, and because of that, there's more, more yawning in a way. There's some other studies, this is a study uh, that showed that yawning uh, is actually, or the effect of yawning is related with age. So when we do this with, with younger people, you're more likely to trigger a yawning cascades uh, compared to, owner pe to other people. But uh, you can actually also do this, um, uh, uh, you know, as I said, give it a try. Uh, it actually that might work. Uh, maybe you've been in situations where the whole thing happened with laughing, you know, where somebody starts laughing and at some point everybody laughs and then you wonder why the hell are we laughing? Nobody really knows. Anyway, so it kind of goes on. But the big point for us here really is, is uh, that uh, um, there's, no, there's no physical virus that gets transmitted here. You see the point? It's not like, I don't know, uh, Wuhan virus spreading from one person to another in a way, like a physical thing that spreads. You just see other people yawning and you start yawning. So what happened here? You see something, you know, there's nothing physically that is getting transmitted. So we call that uh, social contagion. And uh, we know that yawning is social and contagious. I actually have another video in that regard, which is sort of curious, which was not really scientific, but I came across it as part of a, of a, of a TV show where they did that for the candid camera, uh, which also highlights that. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, He looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> Now, 
Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> see if we can use <laughs> now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good now in a moment on Charlie's signal everybody turns forward notice they take off their hats and now do you think we could reverse the procedure watch Okay, so uh, this is like an old TV show, you know, kind of, an old TV show, um, and uh, you know, uh, there are all sorts of problems with that. First of all, it's kind of a funny story. You can try it, you know, do it over here. Go to the elevator, uh, take three people and kind of see what happens, you know, it actually would be fun. We'd like to hear uh, what, what the result is. Obviously, there are other problems with this study, you know, for example, maybe there are some physical things, or maybe the situation really changes. Maybe the guy is not, it's not about social influence. Maybe the guy is worried about getting sick and he doesn't want to face people facing them. I don't know, because they might, they might kind of spit or they might kind of transmit a virus, which is more likely when you stand in front of somebody and compared to when you look at somebody's back, right? So you see how there are all sorts of things that you need to consider here, uh, uh, which, which makes this uh, often, often less easy to, to study than one thinks. Whenever that is, you get a general idea, you know, about how our behavior is often dependent on what other people do or how we get influenced by the people around us. And, you know, when there's nothing being transmitted and we talk about the social behavior, we call it the social contagiousness. And um, show it for yawning, I don't know, here standing in the elevator, but actually it really also holds for other things. Holds for all these phenomena that now it becomes really interesting from a sociological point of view. Uh, we find that obesity is contagious. So when you have uh, friends who are obese, you're more likely to become obese yourself. Uh, or the other way around as well. You know, when you have friends who are anorexic, you're more likely to develop eating disorders as well. Uh, or crime is contagious. Or when you have friends or people you hang out with who are kind of uh, um, are, are criminals, you're more likely to become a criminal yourself. Sadly, suicide is contagious. Divorces are contagious. So when uh, your friends get divorced, you're more likely to get a divorce as well. Stress is contagious, pregnancies are contagious, smoking is contagious, getting a job is contagious. You see, all of these are phenomena uh, where we don't really have something that spreads physically. Yeah? But nevertheless, it exhibits the, the, the pattern of something that spreads, of a diffusion, almost like a disease that spreads. But there's no virus that is being transmitted here. But nevertheless, we have the same pattern. So now what I ask you to do is kind of in a small little group, I want you to think about other examples from your everyday life where you think social contagion um, is going on. So where behavior spreads even though there's no physical virus spreading. So Chase, take two or three minutes and then we talk about it. Thank you. 
Okay, let's let's stop. So a couple of examples. What did you guys come up with? Hang on, say this again. People. If I were to pack up something, I see, I see, yeah. do this class, yeah. it's very likely a lot of people would do the same thing. Okay, let's think, let, let's on. let's think that through. Why do you think that might happen? People mm -hmm. think that you know what time it is, so they assume that you know it's over. Okay, that's actually a mechanism called rational imitation that he's talking about. We'll talk more about that later on. Uh, you think that you see somebody else and think, hang on, maybe that person knows more than I do. Yeah? So maybe kind of it's a good idea. Well, in this case, it's maybe, I don't know, maybe not the most rational thing to do that, uh, because I remember you. Um, but and let's say the example of that is you are in a traffic jam, or you hit a traffic jam. Uh, that's where, where this kind of place. Let's say you drive on the highway, and uh, you see the car in front of you stopping, yeah, or slowing down. What are you going to do? I'll probably you slow down as well a little bit. You see, first of all, okay, let's check the situation. Maybe that car in front of me sees something that I don't see. Uh, or maybe that car in front of me knows something that I don't know. And that's sort of like this one mechanism that you just described uh, in that regard. So maybe somebody knows something more than I know yeah, about the time. In this case, I don't know, it's hard to it's a little debate. There's a, there's a clock here, and other people have watches in a way. So maybe, maybe that argument doesn't really hold that well here. Uh, what is another reason why that might happen? That you might pack up and other people kind of pack things up? They want the class to end. Okay, but that's sort of not a social influence thing that goes on. Maybe it's just I'm just really boring, yeah? and because then you just want to get the fuck out of here, uh, and, and then you kind of pack up. But that means everybody sort of ex is experiencing that. And you see, that's actually one of the difficulties about social influence. How can we know that there's not something that affects everybody else in the same way? How, how can we know that there's sort of like a, like a, that people do that because you did something? What is another reason why they might do that? Well, we'll talk much more about norms at some point, right? Because if you kind of pack things up, uh, you, we all have an idea about what is an accepted behavior, you know, especially in this room, you sit here, I don't know, the norm is that you are quiet. I don't know, the norm is that I have say something intelligent, you know, I don't know, uh, and th that's how, what we kind of agreed upon in a way. That's how this goes. And, and when kind of then somebody packs things up, you say, okay, hang on, apparently it seems to be accepted. Somebody else is doing that, so why shouldn't I do that, right? So you see that norm is being, actually it might be even more that actually the conditions change. Imagine you pack things up and you become, you're allowed through that. 
That means that if you actually want to listen to what I talk right, and what I say, then you might have more difficulties to hear me because somebody else packs things up and is loud. Yeah? And that's sort of a change of situation for you too. So you see a lot of things that actually can go on about how or why social influence happens. So, so that's what I meant earlier. I don't know, just doing the elevator trick, you know, that, that's just, I don't know, the, the, the beginning of the story. And then you actually have to go on to figure out what else is going on. So maybe folks give me some other examples about what you talked about social influence voice. Somebody over there? Um, crying. Crime? Crying. 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 Okay, so you start crying and then somebody else cries. Um, again, you know, it might be maybe we heard the same thing or maybe we witnessed the same thing. And uh, interesting, it's actually a study that I'm, I'm currently working on. I want, to, I want to talk about this at a conference this summer uh, because I think sometimes we need to think about the time delays. Yeah, maybe there was one event, one event we both witnessed. Let's say there's an accident, a terrible accident on the, on the street. Yeah? We both witnessed it at the same time. And uh, I start crying, because I think this is horrible. Uh, and then you start crying uh, half a minute later. Right? So you see what I mean? It might not necessarily be that you cried because I cried. It might be because we witnessed the same thing, and actually we have different incubation periods, I don't know, or different processing types in a way. But it might still be the case, you know, I don't know, somebody cries and you, I don't know, you get into it and actually it, it's, it, it probably, probably does happen to some degree, you know, with the same argument as with the yawning. There's something about empathy, you know, we care about others. Actually, we mimic others in so many ways. Actually, I had a PhD student who looked at conversational dynamics. That's very fascinating as well. So when we kind of talk with each other, not only do we look at each other and kind of, you know, I, I, I adjust gestures, I don't know, movements and so on, but actually people even align with the kind of words that you use. Something you can try out at some point. You know, just you start using, I don't know, some fancy words in a conversation or where you could even use another word you know, that would, would, be easily, would easily work or a sort of like a sentence or, or something. And what you will see is a chance are much higher that the other people pick that up. Yeah? And then you kind of you align that you kind of almost train that. There was another hand going up over there. Rioting. Rioting. Uh, rioting is a good one. Uh, and actually, we'll have a, a, a littering. You know, we have a whole lecture on that. Uh, it's called the broken window theory. It's actually totally the case. So if I kind of go and throw rubbish here on the floor, uh, actually, it increases the chance for other people to throw rubbish on the floor. Again, this might be, OK, like the norm has been broken, or you might think, OK, what's, what's, the, what's the point? Somebody needs to come and clean it up anyway, so I can as well throw something else on the floor, because it doesn't, you know, it's, sort of, it's, a, it's a way of rationalizing things. And it might actually objectively change the situation. But um, uh, that, that's actually a problem. That's one of those reasons why sometimes there are these zero tolerance policies in place. Yeah? Not because of one little thing. I don't know. It's because it triggers all these other things that kind of follow them. And rioting social movements, uh, that's a big one where you could actually also we have a whole lecture on that when we talk about uh, threshold effects about how cascades can evolve. You know, if everybody goes on the streets, you just join it as well. You know, I don't know, uh, and 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 that's kind of these weird things where sometimes protest movements are very small, while other times Fridays for Futures becomes huge. I don't know. Of course, it's not a big issue as well, but actually, there's also another phenomenon going on here: is that there is an influence effect happening. You know, if everybody else goes, okay, I want to be there too, or I don't know, uh, again, like different things happen. Maybe another example from the middle. What did you guys come up with? Yeah? Going to class. Going to class. Good. Okay, that's an interesting one, because uh, how, how would the ones that go to, to, don't go to class know that you went to class? Because they weren't here to witness you. Or maybe you talked to them about it. I don't know, so maybe that's the thing. So we tell them, hey, it was an awesome class. We, Actually, we started yawning all together, you know. Um, uh, okay. But it might also be another thing. It might also be, well, it's a social thing. You guys sit together, you chat, you have a coffee afterwards, you meet before, in a way. Yeah? So that kind of might, might happen here, too. Uh, but basically, the story is there's a lot of phenomena that are socially contagious. And one of the things that always strikes me is that a lot of sociologists don't really look at that. I wonder how the hell can we not look at that? How can we pretend that our observations are independent from each other, while something like social influence is so prevalent in our everyday life? Yeah? When we just look around, it's scary how prevalent things are. 
you know, uh, um, actually, um, I, I tried once at the bus stop, just tell, because I don't know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a geek, I kind of, I try these things out all the time. I kind of, you know, I stand, I stand at the bus stop in a different way, I look in the other direction and see what happens. And actually, it, 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 does, it does work. So social influence, when we talk about social influence, or sometimes we call it social contagion as well, there are subtle differences, but I'm not going to talk about that. Social influence is defined as a change in an individual's thoughts, feelings, attitudes, or behaviors that result from interaction with another individual or a group. You know, and social psychologists, they're often interested in conformity, compliance, obedience, you know, about the specific mechanism, about why the guy in the elevator turns around, you know, like what's going on here. While for us, it, it is sort of, um, it's one of those things where we're interested in, okay, hang on a moment, how is that actually happening within a social context, right? How does the market condition affect that? And how, when uh, social influence does take place, how does that actually lead to other macro level phenomena again? So think of our Coleman board that we had here. You know, we have the macro phenomena that we kind of try to link, and we kind of think about it, okay, what's happening at the lower level of individuals, because individuals act, you know, individuals are embedded in society, you know, in a social context, uh, opportunities and constraints and so on, they behave. And when other individuals behave, you know, we, we kind of aggregate things up again, like the patterns that then come about, inequalities or, or whatnot. It's interesting, the yawning still works, you know, so, so some people keep yawning and believe me, it's going to happen for me all day long. Um, so, um, so now, uh, how I'm going to apply this is sort of uh, in, in two ways. So I have like two studies that I brought with me. Let's see if we kind of get started with one at, at the very least. About how network structure affect individual behavior and the adoption. And in this case, I brought something about uh, medical innovations with me. And another one is about when individuals hear about, you see how the structure, now I could, I could look at from where do they hear it? You know, like how are they embedded? But now I don't really care about that. I just care about, okay, individuals hear about others. Uh, they kind of do something, how does that then lead to a behavior which then ultimately leads to a macro phenomena again? And there we're going to talk about unpredictability or inequality in cultural markets. Yeah? But how you cannot really know whether something is successful or not, like a movie or a book or something. It's really hard to guess because it's actually quite unpredictable. But actually, this is a result of, of these phenomena that we have. So the first one is a study on medical innovation. Um, and let me get started. So, you know, this is sort of a, a landmark study, and that's sort of why I selected it, because I think it's kind of helpful to read some old stuff. But when, especially when you read the older stuff, you always need to be aware of, okay, hang on, how could you do this better, you know, and, and, and there are lots of criticisms around that. But nevertheless, it is a, it is a classic by Coleman, Cutts, and Menzel. Um, not just uh, in, from the substantive area, you know, that was like the first time they could large scale at, uh, at uh, social influence but also in the way they did it, because that was one of the first studies with a lot of data, empirical analysis, you know, quite innovative, actually, how they went about that. And uh, it's about this relationship. Well, that's sort of how I like to put it in the context of the last two, three lectures that we had. Okay, it was a study conducted in the 1950s, you know, um, actually it was uh, funded by Pfizer at the, at the time, uh, and, and you know, they had just came up with a new uh, medication, it was a new antibiotic, it was tetracycline, which is still used today, or it's a class of antibiotic, uh, and at the time it was, uh, was quite new, and Pfizer brought that to market, you know, and they started, okay, how can we get, cheap, get this, how can we sell this better? And also fun, so they funded this study, and uh, as part of that study, uh, Coleman and others, they interviewed all medical doctors, GPs in four cities in Illinois uh, at a particular time. And they asked all sorts of questions uh, to those GPs, uh, but they also asked them about who are your friends? Who do you talk to when you have medical, uh, discuss uh, important medical issues? Or who would you ask for advice? And these are what we call network generators. So they ask that about, you know, kind of about the relationships that they have. But not only that, but then they did another thing, and this is sort of where it becomes like quite innovative when I recognize, oh, that's actually pretty cool. Um, they sampled prescription records uh, for um, the, the issue, went to pharmacies. And at the time, you know, they just gave away that information. Now that you couldn't do that anymore. But they went to the pharmacies at the beginning of each month over a longer period of time and asked, so how many times did you guys get a prescription for tetracycline? Like how many times did the doctor 
kind of prescribe this new drug. So it's about the prescription of, uh, of the drugs, you know, like, and that sort of, you know, they kind of went and kind of got that data first and by the pharmacies, which is sort of uh, pretty, pretty cool, I thought. Um, and then they kind of looked at when, when did those pharmacies get these prescriptions from, uh, from these doctors. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned before, in the interviews with those doctors, they asked them, who are your friends among your colleagues? But they also asked them, with whom do you often discuss your cases? Or to whom do you often turn for advice and information? You know, like friends, I don't know, um, a discussion uh, for medical cases or advice. And these are what we call network generators. So it's about a relationship that is being asked here. You know? Uh, it's not just about the individuals, but about who do you talk with. And, and then we can actually go, and, th and that's what they did, uh, we, can, we, can, we can look at, um, first of all, this is now a graph from, from the actual paper. What you see here on the, on the x-axis is time. It's basically months after the release of this new drug. So the drug came to the market, which is great. So there was a starting point, and it could not have been prescribed before. It came to the market, and then time goes on. Yeah. And as a, like, I don't know, almost like one and a half years after uh, the drug first came to market, Pfizer looks at, okay, how many times, or they know uh, uh, how many times the drug was got prescribed. And uh, what we see on the other axis is the cumulative proportion of doctors who have introduced this new drug. Uh, so this goes, it always goes up, you know, because I don't know, once you introduce, so it's really like how many of the doctors at a particular point in time have already prescribed this drug. Now that's what this says. And there are three different lines. I come to that in a second. But it's really like if this is zero, you know, it means like okay, no doctor prescribed this drug so far. Uh, at, at the end, after 17 months, almost every doctor has prescribed the drug at least once. Right? That's sort of how it goes. You cannot take it back. That's why this number always goes higher up. You know, you cannot make it un, un, unhappy. You cannot unprescribe. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of like a diffusion pattern. You know, it's like a very simple one at an aggregate level. You know, it's really at an aggregate level, we see kind of how many, how many folks prescribe a drug. But now they kind of looked at that for different subgroups of, of doctors. You remember they have the prescription, so they actually see who prescribed it and who didn't, in a way. And they have like the full sample of all doctors that kind of lived in that area, in these uh, cities in Illinois. So now they put them in, in three different categories, in a very simple way. The ones that kind of didn't mention any friends and the question about friends. The ones that kind of said, okay, they have one or two friends among the other doctors, or uh, some others that had like three or more friends among the other doctors. Also, the no friends refers to among the other doctors, yeah, among those, I don't know, in Illinois. And what we see here right now is, well, as you see, as we kind of go up, the, the curve for the guys that have no friends among the other doctors in Illinois seems to be less steep. You know, it's a little lower than the one for the ones that have three or more friends in that area. So what, can we, what could we conclude from that? Well, in that paper, they actually concluded from that that, hang on, if people have more friends who are other doctors in a way, they seem to adopt this new drug faster. Yeah? So the ones that are more connected amongst the, in the medical community in that area, they seem to adopt that drug faster. And you, know, you could take that, so doctors who were mentioned by their colleagues as a friend or actually also as an advisor or discussion partner, prescribed the new drug on average earlier than those who were named by few or none of their colleagues. And now we could actually take that, and that's how it was interpreted as an, as a, as an indicator for social influence. Why would that be the case? Well, if you, have, if you have no friends among the medical community, you know, you're actually, you don't meet anybody who could, who could actually tell you about the drug. Right? But if you have a lot of other doctor friends, you have a higher chance to be told about the new drug. And it's all, it's again, it's like thinking about this, okay, how can we, what, how would it actually, how would this mechanism play out? So if this is a very tech, very medical, very specialized question in a way, you need to have other, and you know, there's no physical virus being transmitted. You need to hear about it somehow from the other, if this is the mechanism going on. Of course, there could be other things going on, right? So for example, it could be on those guys that just read in, read in medical journals, for example. Now, it's not just all about friendship relationships. There could be other factors that kind of play out. And maybe those guys, who, uh, who are more connected in the medical communities, they are just, I don't know, bigger nerds to begin with. They don't have another life, so they also read more medical journals, and that's where they get it from. You know? You see, and that's sort of like a criticism of this paper, 
So that's why you have to always take these, these patterns, especially when they're presented at the macro level with a grain of salt, because they don't really highlight the mechanism about what's going on. Yeah? But it is a possible outcome. So if it actually is the case that, uh, that uh, um, I don't know, my medical doctor friends uh, um, uh, tell me about it, and that's why I kind of start prescribing the drug. If I don't have any medical doctor friends, I should be less likely to start prescribing. And that's what is, what is the result here. Another finding in this study was that networks mattered more at the beginning of the adoption phase. Yeah? So whether you kind of had like a, um, you see at the beginning there's a quite a steep increase. I mean, you look for example at month six, seven, or eight, or so on. There's quite a difference, or even month ten. There's quite a difference. While later on it doesn't really matter anymore. So later on it seems to sort of, I don't know. At some point everybody figures out that this is a good drug, uh, but it really seems to matter in terms of the speed of people figuring that out. Uh, different kinds of networks uh, matter at different points in time. Then it was also a, a finding. I, I don't have a slide for that, but it's in the paper. So at first the discussion, advice network mattered more, and later the friendship network mattered more. So it's, 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 it's aligned with our reasoning, you know. I don't know. Um, you say you're a medical doctor, you kind of start really listening to the advice that you know. That's sort of what matters, not necessarily what your friends say at the beginning. Later on, I kind of you're more convinced by that. And then your friends say it, and then that might matter too. But at the beginning, you might want to see the hard evidence or the real experiences, and maybe friendship doesn't matter that much. Um, and there was another thing that the doctors were more influenced by others in uncertain situations in treatments uh, whose effects are unclear. So again, you know, it's kind of there's some indication that kind of social influence matters here. So it's about the network structure that we have here, and we have uh, the adoption of a behavior uh, that then follows from it. And um, that's sort of like the, the medical innovation study that you guys had to read for this as well. OK, but I now have, and uh, I'm very of the times, but I nevertheless get started with it. Um, we have cultural market studies, which is sort of another another uh, uh, landmark study, even though it was only conducted like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, there was a paper that you guys had to read. Um, I think that's the one that you had to read. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's basically based on a couple of science papers. There are two science papers, which are also very easy to read. Oftentimes, these papers are really nice and easy to read. There's more to it. You know, I don't know. There's often like a 50-page supplementary material, I don't know, that you find online where they really talk about the nitty-gritty details, about how they've done something in a way. Uh, this is sort of a summary of that in the, in the Handbook of Analytical Sociology and Social Influence, Matthew Darnick and Duncan Watts, who are both uh, fascinating guys. Uh, I don't know, Duncan Watts worked for uh, Yahoo and then for Microsoft, was a big professor at Columbia, now he's at uh, Pennsylvania, and Matt Salganik, he's at, uh, at Princeton. Uh, but they kind of, they were sort of, uh, uh, and, and, and within the grand scheme of things, now we're looking at how, how do certain macro level patterns come about when individuals get social influenced by others. And with cultural markets, I mean the following. You know, like cultural markets, interesting, the yawning still works. It's great, you know, and see how long that lasts all day. Uh, with cultural markets, I mean the following. Um, so it's like, I don't know, book sales, for example, or, uh, I don't know, movies, you know, or music. <coughs> These are, or, I don't know, or, or, or theater plays or whatnot. These are cultural markets. And um, in the Harry Potter books, you know them. The interesting thing is those books, they were rejected by seven publishing houses before they actually got published. And now, I don't know, they, were, they sold collectively over 300 million times, uh, you know, one of the most successful book series ever, you know, while most authors hardly sell a few thousands. But at the time, seven publishing houses rejected it. As you can imagine, they were biting their ass. Yeah? They, they kind of missed out on that opportunity. They, they missed out on a lot of money. Another example, the Star Wars franchise. We all know it. it's a multi-billion business these days. Now it's kind of crazy what's happening here. But again, like the script had to be shopped around for, for quite a while to finally find uh, um, um, some movie producers that were willing to take the risk, to take the gamble. Keep in mind that the days when the first movie came out back in the 1970s, there was nothing comparable. There hadn't been any, any big uh, sci-fi hits like that before. It was really unknown territory. It was really like, ah, oh, should we really go for that? No, we don't really know. We have nothing really to compare it with. 
So it almost, it almost didn't happen. Um, so uh, it was often viewed as, as, as a, by, by insiders that, I don't know, this is going to flop, you know, it's like a big, big gamble. And, you know, you, we all know what came out of it. It became one of the biggest uh, movie franchises in history. Or American Idol, you know, maybe you remember this show, and it lasted, it went on for years. There was like 15 seasons and so on every year. Uh, nowadays, luckily, the thing faded out a little bit. Maybe it's going to get some revivals, but I don't know. Um, this show was rejected by three television stations first as well. They didn't want to go for it. They thought, ah, oh, this is not going to work. And it became a huge international hit. Yeah? All over the world, it popped up. There were national versions of it and so on. It became like hugely successful. But again, before, uh, folks didn't really think that it would work. So what we see here is uh, there's actually a lot of uncertainty. And you know, this is sort of where we get with that, that actually there is, when you have social influence mattering, we have a lot of unpredictability in, in, in the market that we don't really know whether something works out or not. You know, another example with cultural markets, you know, I like these, I, like these uh, I don't know, superhero movies and whatnot, but DC really fucked it up for me, you know, kind of, I don't know, I rarely walk out of a movie, but I did walk out of some of those latest Superman versus Batman movies, and, you know, it's just really bad. It's really bad. You wonder how can they do that? They spent hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions on that, and they make something really bad like that. Yeah? That's a waste of money. Didn't somebody kind of tell them that this doesn't work? You know? But actually, as it turns out, these things are really, really difficult to predict. In, in hindsight, you know, we can say it, but at the time, you know, we hardly, we hardly we can't tell it. So I don't know, I'm lately was really excited about the new Star Trek Picard series, and I'm really disappointed so far. I really think it's not, it's not that good. Um, I, I had high hopes, uh, but these things are just very, very unpredictable. And, and now, as it turns out, in this paper by Salganic, Dots, and Watts, and we'll talk more about that uh, in the next lecture, um, social influence, when people get influenced by others, can lead to cumulative advantages where those who are seen as successful become even more successful. You know, it's, it's called the Matthew effect. We'll talk more about that as well. Where some things really become big, you know, even though original differences were really small, but suddenly because others are already going there, then Star Wars becomes a huge thing because everybody talks about it. You want to see it any, as well. I don't know, you want to be part of the conversation or whatnot. And that this can actually then lead at the macro level to two things, to inequality, yeah, where suddenly things become really, some things are being weighted really high and others are really weighted very low. And we would not have that difference, that inequality, if we would not have social influence. And the second thing that they kind of show is that this can lead to unpredictability. With unpredictability, we mean that, okay, we don't really know which one is going to be successful. It's kind of this weird thing. We kind of can actually tell that there's going to be big differences because what, what we like and what we don't like, but we don't really know which one is going to be the one that is going to take off. And they've done that in the context of a music lab, but I'm going to talk about that the next time, but let me switch to, um, I'm going to talk about that the next time. So uh, let's finish over here. No new reading for next uh, Thursday. I'm going to continue talking about social influence. We're going to continue talking about that, but also present you some other studies on social influence. Yeah? So see you on Thursday. And try the thing with the elevator and tell me about it. Yeah? I'm curious. <laughs>